have an emergency. Today on Rescue 911, Daredevil skiers out for fun defy the odds. I knew we had problems. When an avalanche sends a wall of snow sweeping down on them. There was a very good possibility that we weren't going to find anybody alive. Witness a grueling search for survivors. Plus, Stop it up, baby. Come on. it's every mother's nightmare. I saw a baby that's jumping. When efforts to save her child. We still had a total blockage of air. Becomes a race against time on Rescue 911. We begin early on February 19, 1990. Before leaving for the snowy mountains near East Layton, Utah, 21-year-old Todd Van Buren had told his parents of his plans for the day. Todd had indicated to me that he and Scott Jaime were going to go snowshoeing, and he would leave his truck as far as they could get it. You right, Todd? Still here. So I knew where he was going. He said he would be home by dark, if not before. I think this was probably a new challenge for him. Todd had talked about it for a long time. If there was some good hills, they wanted the skis there so they could ski down and tube down. We continue. We've had several rescues that year, and this one here, with the snow as deep as it was, the cold weather, there was a very good possibility that we weren't going to find anybody alive. Scott Jaime and Todd Van Buren were hiking 8,000 feet up the side of a mountain in an isolated area when an avalanche sent a wall of snow sweeping down the mountain toward them. Around 8 o'clock that evening, the Van Burens heard from Scott's girlfriend, Kim Thomas. Oh, Kim. Yeah, have you heard from Scott? I had called Todd's parents and spoke to his mother, and she said they were beginning to get a little worried. I was scared the fact that maybe there was something really wrong. You stay there. Todd has always been very conscientious about where he was going, when he was going to be home. I just had the feeling that, let's go look. We know where he's at. Let's go see if we can find the truck. As usual, Todd had drawn a map for his parents so they'd know what part of the mountains he was heading for. When I drove up this road and wound around and my headlights hit Todd's truck, I knew we had problems. Search and rescue teams from Davis County were called to the scene, as well as a life flight helicopter. One of the flight paramedics was K.D. Simpson. Moving people in there by ground it would take hours and hours. And then go back the other way. It would be very difficult to actually locate the skiers because of the, the size of the area. There's a large area to get lost in. Around 10.30, volunteers with the Davis County Search and Rescue ground units began arriving, headed by Bill Jensen. So I can distinctly remember that was one of the coldest nights we've ever had. Hey guys, how's it going? We've had several rescues that year, and this one here, with the snow as deep as it was, the cold weather, 
there was a very good possibility that we weren't going to find anybody alive. We chose a ridge that was directly above where the truck was parked. Uh, I think we got some tracks. We're at. Okay, right there along the line there. We could see what appeared to be a ski trail going right up the ridge of the mountain. Okay, those tracks are just, I'm just following them right down there with the light. They're going right into those trees. Nope. Are these just footprints? We followed them up the mountain. But you couldn't see where they went down. Scott's girlfriend, Kim Thomas, came to the base camp to wait. The highway patrolman told us there could be a chance that we might not find him that night. I knew if we did not go out and find him that night, that they might not make it. We could see a small slide that went through the tracks. Let's just continue on up here further. Pilot Craig Cowley flew the helicopter as low as he safely could in the dark. We were not having any luck picking up tracks. I continued descending down into the canyon so that hopefully we could pick them up going out the other side. I just happened to spot some movement. Roger, we got two individuals down here, it looks like. They're at the bottom of the canyon. One's waving at us, uh, very little movement, if any, from the second one. Right. Down four, what kind of landing zone do you It think? tore me apart as a father. I love my son very yeah, much. And if anything would happen to him, it would be like part of my life was gone. We were looking for a landing zone, and there was nothing close, nothing at all. I think we're going to have to go back the other way to find a zone. I don't see anything. I don't either. The hover loading can be a very dangerous situation. If any of us make a mistake, if somebody slips as they're getting out, they could drag us into the mountain, our blades could hit something. It can be a, a very disastrous consequence. Back at the base camp, plans were being made to try to get the young men out of the steep canyon, no matter what their injuries. It didn't seem that we were that far away from the two victims in the beginning, but it ended up taking us about 40 minutes to get to them. We immediately started looking at the one that was injured, which is Scott. And it was obvious that he had a broken leg. His fever. I'm okay. They were very hypothermic. They had been wet and that the clothing had frozen. Hey, tell me what happened. We were skiing down a slope. And when I came down to Scott after the avalanche had stopped, that's when he said that his leg was broken. Todd had splinted Scott's leg with a ski pole. Then they began to make their way slowly down the mountain. I dragged him for about four hours like this. By that time, I was totally exhausted. I fell backwards into the water. It felt like it was 20 below zero. We just started cuddling up together from there, uh, trying to conserve each other's body heat. As you look down into the city where we was at, the lights were out there and we thought, you know, here we are up here freezing and nobody down there know we're up here. I believe they were to the point where they were beginning to go downhill, so to speak. Okay. Scott was scared, and he was truly afraid that he wasn't going to make it out of there. He told us that a couple times. Additional rescuers were carefully brought in by helicopter three at a time. We had some powdered Gatorade, and we began then giving this to Todd and Scott. Okay, we've got warm fluids. After three or four cups, you could see a difference. Scott had been loaded into a Stokes basket, but the problem was how to get him up out of the canyon to the helicopter. Volunteer Jeff Warsham coordinated the effort. Each step was really critical. 
the steepness of the terrain and how slick and well, wet it was, we knew it was going to be a lot of work getting him out of that area. Todd had to try to hike up to the helicopter. After I'd shaken so long, my thighs and my hips were so tired that there were times when I couldn't even lift my own leg. It was like being paralyzed. And the rest of the 15 individuals we had up on the side of the hill started working on carrying Scott across the side of the ridge line. My wife and I sat there and watched as that helicopter light departed the canyon and started toward the base camp. I kept thinking, who is on that helicopter? I was frantic. You want to hope that it's it's your boy that walks off there, and yet you feel guilty if it is. I had really mixed emotions. An individual stepped off the helicopter, and I could see it was Todd. The first thing he said to me was, Dad, what took you so long? And I said, Honey, it's been a long night, and you're fine now. And that's, that was just probably the most thrilling moment in my life to have my son back and to know that he was okay. Reality hit when I saw him. I was glad that he was okay, yet I was hurting inside, not knowing Scott's injuries and, and that he was still up on that mountain. He'd been there for a long time, very, very cold, so we didn't know what other damage was done. We were very cautious and moved very slowly as we went up the side of the mountain. It took rescue workers two and a half hours to carry Scott the few hundred yards up the hill to the helicopter loading site. At the hospital, he underwent surgery for his broken leg and was released after five days. When I was in the avalanche, on the way down, I thought I was going to die. And I was telling myself, this can't be it. This just can't be my death. I've just got too much to do. This is I feel like I'm indebted to the rescue workers and everybody who's helped out. The amount of time they spent getting us out of there, I just feel grateful that they were there. Todd recently became a volunteer with the Davis County Search and Rescue Team. After seeing the Search and Rescue handle the situation like they did, I've been on one side of the fence, now I wanted to get out and help people that were maybe out there in the same situation I was in. If we did not know the general area where they were at, we could have searched all night and never found them. That's probably, in the order of things, the most important thing they did was to tell someone where they were going. I'm very grateful for what Todd did for Scott. He saved Scott's life. I just don't think I could ever imagine life without Scott. I have a lot of love for Todd. I mean, that might sound corny, but what he has done for me is something that words can't explain. I don't know if I'll ever be able to repay Todd. I hope I do someday. I hope I get the opportunity to prove myself that I'm just as good a friend to him as he is to me. Next. I was losing the battle against time. Come on, Ryan. My baby is slipping away. Twenty-eight-year-old Donna Voschel was well-trained in life-saving techniques, and twice before she had used those skills to save the lives of two local children. But on November 14th, 1989, one of Donna's own kids would desperately need her help. Donna had stayed in Norfolk, Virginia with her four kids while her husband was overseas with the Navy. On that morning, she was home with her daughter, Sarah, and her youngest, 23-month-old Ryan. I was sitting at the, the dining room table looking through newspapers because I like to send my husband articles about what's happening with the Navy around here or just the local news. That's a good boy, Ryan. The men overseas like to hear what's happening in their hometown. Around 9 a.m., Robert Gower and Donald Coleman arrived to finish installing an air conditioning unit in back of Donna's house. This was our last day on the job, and uh, we'd only had about a half a day's 
left of work to do. Being a mother of four children, I seem to be able to tune in to when my, what my kids are doing, even when they're out of my sight or if I'm not looking directly at them. The first thing I noticed was the baby reach up on top of the TV. And I thought he was just reaching up to pick up a magazine. was choking on something, but I had no idea what. Mommy! Ryan, cough it up! Come on, Ryan! Cough it up, baby! Come on! Ryan! Ryan! Come on, Ryan! Ryan! Then there was no change at all. Oh, God. He still had a total blockage of air. I didn't see anybody, but I did see the contractor's truck. And then I thought, the Heimlich maneuver. Ryan! Come on, Ryan! Come on, baby! Cough it up, baby! Come on! Come on, Ryan! Ryan, Ryan! I was losing the battle against time. Come on, Ryan! Come on, sweetheart! Come on, baby. My baby is Come slipping up. away. Come on, Ryan! I definitely needed help. It had been two minutes since Ryan stopped breathing. I really didn't know what we could do. I thought to myself, just go up there and try to do something. Neither of the men had training in first aid. Go down now and watch. Okay. Yeah, he's not breathing either, darling. Not the police, I'm trying to him. I, I saw a baby that's choking. Come on, boy. See if you feel something in his throat. I don't see or feel anything. Watch out. Is he not breathing at all? We don't know what that. Then he's going to be okay. Just calm down, ma'am. As long as he's breathing, he'll be okay. Just stay on the line with me for just a second. I absolutely, I just couldn't look. I don't think I wanted to know if the baby had passed out yet. I just couldn't handle it at that moment. He was struggling for air. I mean, I could tell he wasn't breathing. He was just like gasping. And uh, I said, you know, I thought to myself, man, we, we got problems here, you know. Come uh, on. Then I thought we let's try this highway maneuver. Let me try this. I didn't know how to do it, but I just I've seen pictures of it done and heard people talk about how it's done. So I just tried that. Come on, come on, boy. spit it up. Come on, son. Is he crying? All right, get him to cry, ma'am, or is he is he doing okay? Are you alright? He's talking now. He is? You don't need a rescue unit. No. Okay, we'll go ahead and cancel it. Uh-huh. It was like total relief. I just picked him up and just wanted to hold him really tight and was so thankful that he was okay. Lucky. He's all right now, isn't he? Yeah, he's okay. You ready? Ready? Ryan has suffered no ill effects from the incident. Three months later, he seems to have forgotten all about it. The whole event was extremely terrifying. You feel this overwhelming responsibility to this child who is looking to you to make it all better. And here comes a situation where you can't make it all better. It was very overwhelming. Sarah and Ryan are, are very close, so she's always looking out for him. Glad Ryan the cake. Because I love him. I mean, it never crossed my mind not to help. I mean, how can somebody ask you to help her in a situation like that? How can you, you know, you can't say no. I didn't have time to think about it, really. I just ran up and tried to do what I could do, you know, or whatever I could do to help. 
I thought it was very ironic that they have no training and I've been trained for 10 years. They didn't think twice about being in, getting involved. They are very special men. They saved his life. If you are interested in learning life-saving techniques, contact the American Heart Association or the American Red Cross.